Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. A bunch of you wrote in the other day asking me to pick up this new Walmart on Google TV box. It just popped up at my local store, so I was able to grab one the other day, and I got it running here on the desk. And this is a $20 4K HDR streaming box running with Google TV, and it costs half of what Google's Chromecast 4K costs, and it might be something that some of you might find some value with. And what I like about these Walmart boxes is that it's coming from a reputable name brand as opposed to some of the generic brands that you might find out there on e-commerce sites. And I've always been very nervous about buying some of these no-name Android boxes because many times they're running with less than official versions of the Google operating system and there could be some issues with people getting a hold of your login credentials as well. Here you've got something that's legit Google TV, that's very low cost, yet delivers, I think, some value depending on what your needs are. In this review, we're going to look at the casual use cases for this first, and then we'll dive into some more technical stuff for those of you looking to see exactly how much you can squeeze out of this. The spoiler alert here is that there are some limitations to this box, but that's to be expected given the price point. And we're gonna dive into this in just a second, but I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds, all $20 worth. All of the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new TV box is all about. Now there's not much to this, it's just a little plastic puck that you plug into your television with the HDMI port here. One thing to note is that even though this only costs 20 bucks, you do get a three foot HDMI cable in the box. That's not something you get on the $200 Apple TV, for example. So it's nice to see that all the cables you need are included. You also get a USB power supply in the box as well. The power goes in here at the bottom. It's got a micro USB connector for that. This is not a USB type C connector though. So it's still using the older connection format, but it does work. And for the techies out there, I did connect up my little hub here that I like to use with these devices. This one is called an S-Maze, and what it's got is an ethernet jack here at the back, and then three USB ports that you can use to plug in devices. And it works here, which is great. So if you wanted to use something like this, you can. And what this does is it passes power through in addition to allowing all of these devices to activate on the hub itself. But again, you'll get a power cable in the box to plug it in, and this will connect up to your Wi-Fi network. This doesn't support Wi-Fi 6, but it does support AC Wi-Fi, so it'll work on 5 gigahertz networks along with 2.4 gigahertz networks, and I found the Wi-Fi performance to be adequate for streaming the things that it's designed to stream. And we'll talk more about Plex and other formats a little later in the video when we get to the techie stuff. Now inside it has an AM Logic S905Y4 processor. It has only though eight gigabytes of storage and two gigabytes of RAM. So this is a very limited device in its overall specifications. It's not going to rival an Nvidia Shield or some of the higher end devices out there, but for what it does, it is more than fine and you will be able to install a couple of games on it along with all the streaming apps that you might want to use with it. It does support HDR if your TV supports that. However, it does not support Dolby Vision and Dolby Vision is supported on the Chromecast 4K along with the Fire TV 4K devices. So if you are using a Dolby Vision set and want to get 4K out of it with this box, you'll need to get a different one because there is no Dolby Vision support on board. They do say it supports Dolby Digital Plus, which includes Atmos support for audio. However, in testing this on Disney Plus, I was not seeing Atmos audio getting triggered on my home theater receiver. So I think the Atmos support might be in need of a firmware update to get working. I did update this to the latest firmware when we were testing it here, so that might need a little work there in the future. But it's not hard to get going. I would uh, suggest that you have your phone out and you will need a Google account to get this thing set up. And I would also suggest downloading the Google Home app, which makes the setup process a lot easier than having to type in your password with the included remote control here. On the topic of the remote control, it's a basic plastic remote here. It runs off of AAA batteries. Looks a lot like the prior version remote. It's not hard to navigate. You do have some of the uh, real estate here at the bottom that they sold off to YouTube, Netflix, and others, so you can get to those apps quickly. You do have a speech button here, so if you hold this down, you can communicate with the Google Assistant, which we'll demo in a little bit. 
You also have the ability now, because this is running Google TV, to set up multiple users on it. So if I hit the user button here, I can quickly switch to other users that I have set up on my device. And the reason why you have multiple users here, I will show you in a minute. They do have some personalization functions. I also like that you can get to the settings here just by clicking the gear button, which is very convenient versus having to navigate there. So nice remote here for what you're getting. And it also has an IR blaster on the front that can adjust volume control on your TV along with turning it on and off. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, the big difference with this new box over their older one is that it's now running with the updated Google TV operating system, and that's built on Android 12. So it's relatively up to date insofar as Android releases are concerned. What Google TV tries to do, like many of the other streaming boxes out there now, is personalize things to your individual tastes. And of course, Google has a lot of information about you. They know what you like. So when you turn on the box and you're logged in with your account, you're gonna see a lot of stuff that it thinks you might want to watch. And I'm a big sci-fi fan, so I get a lot of sci-fi recommendations, and some of them are actually pretty good. You can also search for things and add them to a watch list. So for example, I can do a search for Star Trek The Next Generation. And I did that by pushing down the voice button here at the top. And what I get here is a landing page for Star Trek. I can go and run right over to Paramount Plus here by clicking on the button. I'm sure they're paying to be there. And I can also, as you see here, add it to my watch list so I can put it in a spot and bookmark it so I can come back and watch it later. And I can also rate it, which will inform Google about the kind of stuff that I like to watch. And that will give us additional recommendations. The problem, though, is that it doesn't play nicely with all services. So watch what happens if I search for something on Netflix, Stranger Things. And although it will drop me off and give me a nice landing page for Stranger Things and I can go and watch it by clicking the button here, I can't watch list it for some reason. And I can't note that I've already watched it either. So it's not consistent from one service to the next. And that's something that uh, remains kind of a shortfall of this recommendation engine. You're going to still be missing a lot of stuff because it doesn't support all the different things that are out there. Now, you also have the ability to install apps on here. So you can see I've got a bunch already installed. Some come pre-installed, of course, because they paid to be there. And although you get a list of apps here, it's not the full list that you have installed necessarily. So if you go here to see all, you will get the full list and everything below the line here isn't visible. So if I uh, go over here to my HD Home Run app and go to move, I can move it up here and make sure that it's in that top row every time I log in. And of course, you can just push the button here on the remote to ask it to load up an app. And as you scroll through, you'll get more and more recommendations and everything will be personalized based on the user that's logged in. So when my wife is logged in or the kids are logged in, they're going to see something different. Now, the remote has a live button, which is a bit more limited than it was in previous versions of Android. So if I click on it here, it will bring me to that live option. Unfortunately, all I'm seeing on here is just Pluto TV options being listed and nothing else. And I think it's going to depend on uh, what apps you have installed and which apps are paying or have some agreement with Google to appear in this section. In the past, you used to be able to connect up a TV tuner, for example, and get your regular live TV presented right within the interface, but that does not appear to be the case any longer. However, one thing I do like about it is that it is bringing that recommendation engine over to the live section, so I can watch all of my favorite sci-fi shows here that are running live right now on Pluto, which is kind of cool, but again, uh, very limited based on who wants to play uh, with Google here. Uh, you do have an app section where you can find apps to download, and that includes games and other things. So that is something you can do. And then, of course, you've got your library section where you can find things that you previously purchased through the Google Play Store. And I've done some of those uh, Blu-ray movies that come with a coupon for Google in the box. So a lot of those movies are showing up here. And then my watch list is here along the bottom. Now, as far as the overall performance is concerned, it feels pretty good for a $20 box. I am running it at a 4K resolution right now. As you've been seeing, it's been pretty quick to navigate as you're moving around the menus here. I will load up Netflix real quick just so you can see what it's like to load up Netflix from scratch here. So when you first start an app, it will get a little sluggish getting that app loaded up. 
but once your content starts streaming, it's able to keep up just fine. So you will have a little bit of a loading delay here, and then you gotta navigate the interface and go over to your profile. And once you get to this point, it starts to smooth out a bit. Although you will, again, see some spinning wheels when you first get going. And I found video playback, whether it's 4K or 1080p, is usually pretty responsive to get going. So I'm gonna pull up the Netflix Creative Commons show they have on here. And as you can see, it gets up and running very, very quickly. Uh, this though is running only at 1080p right now because my video system doesn't support the HDCP level that Netflix requires for 4K. However, on my 4K TV, the 4K content did start right up. Let's take a look and see how YouTube handles a 4K 60 frames per second video. So here is that 4K 60 frames per second video now playing back from YouTube. And as you can see here, we are not seeing any drop frames and all is smooth and very responsive from a video playback perspective. So I think no matter what you throw at it, it should work out pretty well. All of the major streaming services are available on this and that includes Apple TV and Netflix and Disney Plus. So it should be on par with its competitors insofar as program offerings. Now this box will double as a Chromecast. So if you're in an app like Netflix that supports Chromecasting, when you click on the casting icon here, you will see your on box along with your other Chromecast devices on the network. And if I click on that right now, what will happen here is it will boot up Netflix and allow me to control media from my phone. So I can start watching something here on the phone and then toss it over to the television. It does take a second to get up and running here, but as you can see, it does work. And I can pause the media here and start it uh, basically using my phone as a remote control. And then I can just as easily toss it back to the phone if I wanted to go back to that device. So pretty cool stuff here and it will work just like a Chromecast device does. You also have full access to the Google Assistant, so you can control your lights and security cameras and everything using the microphone button here at the top. Let's take a look now and see how it handles gaming. Now this game is called Horizon Chase, and usually it runs on just about anything I try it on, but here we're having some significant difficulties. Uh, check out the graphics. It is just missing parts of the game here. Now this game does appear to be running okay. This one is called Subdivision Infinity. And as you can see here, the frame rate looks pretty decent on it and it is able to play without graphical glitches. So it might be a hit or miss thing in the early days of this product in so far as gaming is concerned, but I think it will play a bulk of the uh, lower end titles that you'll find in the Google Play Store. Now I also tried to do some game streaming on the box through GeForce Now, which usually works on even the lowest of the low end devices that I test. Unfortunately, this box cannot maintain a reliable connection to GeForce Now. It kept dropping the connection. Uh, this was over Ethernet, but also over Wi-Fi. So there might, again, be some firmware updates that need to happen here to improve the reliability for game streaming. But in my testing, this is not something I'm going to recommend for that. Now, I did manage to get a gaming benchmark test to work called the 3D Mark Slingshot Test. And there we got a score of 589, which is right in line with what uh, we saw on the prior edition box from Walmart, in addition to what we're seeing currently on the Chromecast with Google TV 4K. So they're all built with the same guts, essentially. Of note, though, the Fire TV Stick 4K Max does do a little better than these other devices. But when it comes to Android gaming, you're not going to see a huge difference between them. So for casual users, I think this is going to work out okay if you're just looking to stream video from your favorite services. However, if you have a Dolby Vision equipped television, I do think it's worth spending the extra 10 or 15 bucks to get a device that supports that HDR mode. I know a lot of TVs now that have Dolby Vision are starting to get a bit old. And if you want to maintain that really nice HDR video quality, you'll need a box that supports it, and this one doesn't. So what about the enthusiast crowd? Well, I tested a bunch of stuff on here that I thought you might find of interest. The first are the ATSC3 broadcasts that are starting to make their way out into different parts of the United States here. I've got one of those broadcast towers not far from me, and what you're looking at here is a signal coming in off of my antenna. The box plays back just fine with this HEVC content and I'm getting AC4 audio to pass through and be properly decoded using the channels app. So that was a good sign. And if you're curious as to how those signals get into the box, I'm using an HD home run network tuner. 
And I've got a whole playlist that you can find down below in the video description. And in full disclosure, the makers of the HD Home Run are an occasional sponsor here on the channel. Now, another thing we talk about here on the channel quite a bit is Plex, and they are in full disclosure a sponsor here on the channel. I tested a bunch of my 4K Blu-ray MKV files to see how those worked out. Believe it or not, the Wi-Fi could keep up with the bit rate and the box switched my TV into the proper frame rates. We were able to get it to switch to 24p mode. It would activate HDR for movies that supported that. But again, this doesn't support Dolby Vision. It also doesn't support lossless audio formats like DTS HD and Dolby True HD. So this is definitely not going to be an NVIDIA Shield alternative, but it does do a pretty good job playing back some of this high bitrate content. But I don't think enthusiasts are going to find a lot of utility with this, given that it doesn't have support for lossless audio or Dolby Vision HDR. Now, as many of you know, I'm a big stickler about frame rate matching. And if you've got content that is shot at 24 frames per second, it should put your TV into that mode so things play back without juddering frames and everything. And this box within its settings has a match content frame rate option. This looks like it's part of Android 12 here. Unfortunately though, it doesn't seem to work. I did set mine to non-seamless because my TV is a little older, but none of the apps that I tested like Netflix and Disney Plus switched the television into that 24p mode. This remains a pet peeve of mine about Android and a few other TV operating systems for that matter and it doesn't yet appear to be working here, and I'm guessing the apps have to support it. Note that the seamless option is the default, and what the a little notice here at the bottom says that if your TV doesn't support seamless, it won't switch. So if you got an older set, as hopefully these developers start supporting things, you definitely want to make sure that you've got that non-seamless activated, so if those apps end up supporting 24p mode, your older TV will match that frame rate. But at the end of the day, I'm probably asking for a little too much out of a $20 box. And if you are looking for something super inexpensive, running Android with the Google TV interface, this is a no-brainer. It is super inexpensive. It is more secure than all the no-name brands you'll find out there. And I think you'll have a fun time playing around with this to see exactly how much you can squeeze out of it. I do think, though, at a minimum, that a 4K HDR box, no matter the price, should support Dolby Vision at this point. And I'm sure there's some licensing costs that bring it well above that $20 price point. But for $30 or so, you can get a Fire TV that does support Dolby Vision. So hopefully in future iterations of this cheap box, we'll see uh, some more HDR options. But again, if you're looking for something super simple and cheap and fun to play around with running an Android operating system, this one is definitely worth checking out. That's gonna do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic AGR, Tom Albrecht, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.